Monsters of the Market, Zombies, Vampires, and Global Capitalism by David McNally. This is the conclusion. Ugly Beauty, Monstrous Dreams of Utopia. Capitalist market society overflows with monsters, but no grotesque species so command the modern imagination as the vampire and the zombie. In fact, these two creatures need to be thought conjointly as interconnected moments of the monstrous dialectic of, moder of modernity. Like Victor Frankenstein and his creature, the vampire and the zombie are doubles, linked poles of the split society. If vampires are the dreaded beings who might possess us and turn us into their docile servants, zombies represent our haunted self-image, warning us that we might already be lifeless, disempowered, agents of alien powers. Under the hegemony of the spirit world of capital, writes Chris Arthur, we exist for each other only as capital zombies, its personifications, masks, supports. To use Marxist terms, in the image of the zombie lurks a troubled apprehension that capitalist society really is a night of the living dead. Arthur's insights returns us to the salient image that proliferates throughout sub-Saharan Africa today. The zombie laborer having emerged in Haiti in the early 20th century. The earliest zombies were indeed dead men working, unthinking body machines, lacking identity, memory, and consciousness, possessing only the physical capacity for labor. Unlike flesh-eating ghouls who have come to stand in for them in the culture industries of late capitalism, these zombies harbor the hidden secret of capitalism, its dependence on the bondage and exploitation of human laborers. However, because they are the living dead, zombies possess the capacity to awaken, to throw off their bonds, to reclaim life amid the, ru amid the morbid ruins of late capitalism. As much as they move slowly and clumsily through the routinized motions of dead in life, zombies also possess startling capacities for revelry and revolt, latent energies that can erupt in riotous nights of the living dead. Bursting across movie screens and the pages of pulp fiction, such zombie festivals contain moments of carnivalesque insurgency, horrifying disruptions of the ordered and predictable and predictable patterns of everyday life. Without warning, a rupture in the fabric of the normal transforms the living dead into hyperactive marauders. The maimed and disfigured seize the streets and invade shopping malls. Authority collapses, anarchy is unleashed. Part of the attraction of such displays and of much of the horror genre generally resides, of course, in its capacity to gratify as much as to frighten. As viewers, we, or at least many of us, derive a deep pleasure from images of fantastic beings wreaking havoc upon polite citizens of well-ordered society. And here we can locate part of the utopian charge animating zombie rebellions. As Bakhtin reminds us, utopia often comes bathed in the grotesque. It does so in reaction to the anti-sensuous, anti-corporal striving of official cultures to tame bodies and desires, enclose property and personality, regulate labor and recreation, control festivity, festivity and sexuality. Against the dreary and anti-corporal seriousness of sanctioned modes of life, oppositional cultures engage in parody by way of inversion. They elevate the degraded and debased, outcasts, freaks, the simple-minded, and the hideously deformed, and they often do so by celebrating the bizarre, fractured, and oversized human body, deploying a grotesque realism that mocks dreary officialdom and inverts its values in symbolic orders. The utopian registers of grotesque realism moves via a dialectic of inversion. The degraded now do the degrading, bringing low that which official culture has elevated, uplifting what has been suppressed. Yet, the utopian impulse highlights rebirth as much as degradation. To degrade is to bury, 
to sow and to kill simultaneously in order to bring forth something more and better, writes Bakhtin. To degrade also means to concern oneself with the lower stratum of the body, the life of the belly, and the reproductive organs. Contrary to the defined and enclosed heroic body of the bourgeois aristocratic male, then the grotesque body is unfinished, outgrows itself, transgresses its own limits. The stress, is, the stress is laid on those parts of the body that are open to the outside world, the open mouth, the genital organs, the breast, the phallus, the pot belly, the nose. And with respect to the zombie genre, we should add, the cut, the sore, the dangling limb, all of them reminders of the corporal fragmentation at the heart of capitalism and of the open wounds that join wage laborers into a monstrous collectivity. To be sure, the culture industries seize on, sanitize, and repackage these carnivalesque images, endeavoring to cathect riotous energies into the consumption of commodities. Such commodification of the carnivalesque proceeds by reifying its elements, replacing regenerating laughter with mere irony. And yet the process of taming subversive impulses is never total. Something always exceeds and resists its grasp. After all, the very, the very de-radicalizing effects of mass culture are achieved only by awakening precisely the desires meant to be sublimated. It follows that a process of comp compensatory exchange must be involved here, as Frederick Jameson observes. If the ideological function of mass culture is understood as a process whereby otherwise dangerous and proto-political impulses are managed and diffused, rechanneled and offered spurious objects, then some preliminary step must be theorized in which these same impulses, the raw material upon which the process works, are awakened within the very texts that seek to still them. And it is these utopian energies that animate the nightmares of the ruling classes, the bad dreams that surface in characters like Jack Cade. In Azaro's father, as he grows monstrously large and vanquishes the thugs of the party, of the rich, in the many-headed hydra of the rebellious mob, in the riotous women of infinite riches, in Frankenstein's creature, in Marx's image of the insurgent global proletariat. One of the decisive things about the many-headed monster and Frankenstein's creature is that they are multiplicities that comprise a unity. The hydra mob's many heads connect to a common body, just as the corporal bits of Frankenstein's creature made up of animal and human parts, cohere into a living, breathing, speaking colossus. The ascription of the latter attribute, speech, is, as we have seen, amongst the most subversive aspects of Mary Shelley's story, perhaps why it is omitted in most film adaptations. It is bad enough, after all, that a creature assembled from, a fragmented, from fragmented parts might actually assume a human form, however distorted. But with speech, it becomes exponentially more threatening, capable of association with others of its ilk. In Shelley's tale, of course, the creature is isolated and forlorn, forlorn desperately seeking a companion. It speaks only to its oppressors and tormentors. But traversing her novel lurks the anxiety that the creature might not forever be alone. That it might acquire a companion, reproduce, and form a monstrous social collectivity. And this prospect is, prospect is hinted at in the Sailor's Rebellion that hurries the novel to its close. Collective rebellion by laborers signals the course imagined by Marx, who is said to have enjoyed the story of Frankenstein. In his call for associated action and organization, Marx imagines that the crippled monstrosity of the working class might reassemble itself, find its voice, and begin to move to a new rhythm, not that of capital's machines, but one of its own making. In this dance of the gravediggers, Marx identifies monstrous forces of redemption and regeneration. He envisions the multiplicity that is the collective worker, acquiring a new consciousness and identity, a new praxis. There is no loss of individuality here. On the contrary, a new mode of individuality is generated in the act of revolutionary reassemblage. In this spirit, 
Marx projects the emancipation of the collective worker in terms of the creation of a new, organic social body, wherein people reproduce themselves as individuals, but as social individuals. In so doing, he envisions proletarian liberation as a dance of the concrete universal, to borrow a term from Hegel, a dynamic to totalization that affirms identity and difference, or what Marx calls elsewhere a unity of the diverse. While Marx himself may not always have envisioned this collective agent in all its potential diversity, this is the direction in which the logic of his position tends. It is suggestive in this regard that Britain's sailors, the group responsible for collective revolt in Frankenstein, were just such a unity of the diverse, multiracial, Irish, English, African, as two historians note. So much was this the case that by the end of the Napoleonic Wars, roughly one quarter of the Royal Navy was black. Assembled from multiple groups of the dispossessed, the deep sea proletariat rose to moments of exceptional militancy and solidarity. It seized ships in mutinous insurgencies. It challenged the rule of state and capital, and it transgressed the enclosures amongst nationalities and ethno-racial groups, acquiring a heightened gr grotesquerie in its violations of the emerging categories of race. Proletarian monsters are, by definition, monsters of the body. Not only do their corporal powers become the life force of capital, enabling the latter's vampire-like expansion. More than this, their emancipatory struggles entail monstrous claims of the body against the abstracting powers of capital. Marx's Dance of the Gravediggers, a festive zombie riot, involves a victory of the sensuous over the non-sensuous, the material over the abstractly ideal. Bodies loom large, grotesquely so, in this narrative of liberation and their monstrous presence reverberates across the stories of zombies on the march. This is the point at which Marx's communist vision rejoins the great plebeian tradition excavated by Bakhtin, <clears throat> in which the immortal laboring people constitute the world's body, in the words of one commentator. It is also the point at which it converges with that anthropological materialism, to use Walter Benjamin's designation, whose pivot is the emancipation of the flesh. In affirming its concrete embody embodiment as a living collectivity, the insurgent working class rescues laboring bodies from their near death. Their function is mere automata that enable capital's valorization. This moment of rebellion is also one of recuperation. The zombies awake and in doing so, reclaim their very corporality from the abstracting powers of capital, establishing the ontological precondition for the recovery of memory identity, and history. So shattering is a zombie awakening, so disruptive of the molecular structure of bourgeois life that it is typically figured as a frenzied upheaval of nature itself. After all, the monstrous collective body of labor inevitably appears as an elementally natural force in a society that has abstracted it from history and the social. Okri grasps precisely this naturalization of the laboring body when, in portraying Azaro's father at work, he tells us that his blood trickled from his back and mixed with the rubbish of the earth. The idiom of horror remains the only genre for registering the insurgency of a monstrous body joined to the very earth itself. Take Dickens's description from Barnaby Rudge. He begins with three ringleaders of the Gordon riots, whom he describes as covered with soot and dirt and dust and lime their garments torn to rags, their hair hanging wildly, wildly about them, their hands and faces jagged and bleeding with the wounds of rusty nails. Behind them is a dense throng of insurgents offering a vision of coarse faces, a dream of demon heads and savage eyes and sticks and iron bars uplifted in the air. This bewildering horror, Dickens writes, pulsed with many phantoms, not to be forgotten all through life. There's a horrified poetics of class and gender at work here. The mob is simultaneously animalized and feminized. Its femininity does not, of course, partake of genteel passivity. Rather, it consists of crazed, transgressive, plebeian womanhood. 
The riotous rabble is defined by blood and dirt, by huge, all-consuming passions, by the life-swallowing powers of Mother Earth. The female grotesque thus features centrally in the construction of the monstrous mob. So do the categories of race. The extent to which the European working classes were racialized in the discourse of emergent industrial capitalism is rarely appreciated today. Yet during the epoch in which scientific racism emerged in order to rationalize the oppression of Africans and colonized peoples, its categories were sufficiently pliable to racialize the laboring poor of Europe as well. Grenier de Cassagnac, for instance, in his Histoire des classes ouvrières et des classes bourgeoises from 1838, asserted that proletarians were a subhuman race formed through the interbreeding of prostitutes and thieves. In a similar register, Henry Mayhew's London Labour and the London Poor from 1861 divided humanity into two distinct races, the civilized and the wanderers. The latter, including the laboring poor of Britain, were defined by their ostensible incapacity to transcend the body and its desires. Similar processes can be observed in Sweden, where proletarians were represented as another race, as crude and coarse, as a seething mass, a formless rabble, partaking in the realm of the primitive, the animal. Central to this racialization and feminization of the working classes was the attribution of a grotesque, of a grotesque corporality. It is this stuff of hyper-embodiment that is frequently celebrated in popular culture, including the horror genre. When the zombies strike back, it is their huge, awkward, oozing bodies that appear most prominently. As in Marx or Bakhtin, there's a plebeian poetics at work here, an ugly beauty of the grotesque body of the oppressed. Here is something lacking, however, in the zombie revolts that emerge in popular culture today, and that something is what has been lost in the transition from Haitian to Hollywood zombies, and the very thing that has been recuperated in zombie tales emanating today from sub-Saharan Africa. Haitian zombies, as we have seen, are mindless laborers, people reanimated from the dead who lack everything, identity, consciousness, memory, language, save the brute capacity for labor. Their physical bearers of labor power are nothing more. This feature figured prominently in American popular appropriations of zombies in the era of the Great Depression. As we have seen in William Seabrook's The Magic Island in 1929, Zombies are portrayed as dead men working in the cane fields, as automatons bent expressionless over their work and throughout the Depression era, the image of the zombie as a living dead laborer was never lost in Hollywood horror. In the film White Zombie in 1932, for instance, Bela Lugosi played Murder Legendre. Bewitched, sinister, factory owner in Haiti who raises the dead to toil in a sugar mill. As one critic of the film remarks, the gaunt, sinewy workers with sunken eyes shuffle in production assembly lines and around the large central milling vat. They are reifications of despair and hopelessness, no more than cogs in the mighty machine themselves. This image of alienated, crushing, mindless labor in capitalist society resonated powerfully in a U.S. racked by unemployment, poverty, and class resentment. But it was largely lost with the revival of the zombie in American culture during the radical upsurges of the 1960s, a revival which owes much to George Romero's pioneering films, beginning with Night of the Living Dead in 1968. For Hollywood's rediscovery of the zombie was, in fact, a revision, one that short-circuited the figure of the zombie laborer. Interestingly, as previously noted, although he used the term living dead, Romero initially imagined his monsters as flesh-eating ghouls, not zombies. And it is that construction as flesh-eating monsters that now defines zombies within mass culture in North America and Europe. This emphasis on consumption, on eating flesh, was central to the displacement of the zombie laborer. By repositioning zombies as crazed consumers rather than producers, 
Recent Hollywood horror films tend to offer biting criticism of the hyper-consumptionist ethos of an American capitalism characterized by excess. But this deployment comes at the cost of invisibilizing the hidden world of labor and the disparities of class that make all this consumption possible. As a result, contemporary zombie films at their best tend to offer a critique of consumerism, not capitalism. One that fails to probe the life-destroying, zombifying processes of work in bourgeois society. The occlusion of the zombie laborer also de-radicalizes images of zombie revolt. During World War II, a period of race, gender, and class upheaval in America, zombies emerged as figures of rebellion. A whole series of 1940s zombie movies, in fact, denied the possibility of complete containment, locating horror in zombie awakening rather than in their passive, controlled state. Rarely, however, was the zombie idiom used as subversively as it was in Jacques Tournier's haunting film I Walked with a Zombie in 1943. Celebrated as one of the finest of all American horror films, I Walked with a Zombie depicts the decline of colonial capitalism in the form of a dysfunctional white family descended from slave owners as it sinks slowly into decay and self-destruction on a small Caribbean island. Deploying a problematically gendered trope, a white woman comes to stand in for a dying colonialism. Characters in the film remark of her, as of her class as a whole, that she was dead in her own life and dead in the selfishness of her spirit. In a dramatic reversal, zombies now take shape as creatures from the imperial metropole, not the colonial hinterland, as the living dead of a morbid colonialism passively waiting to be washed away by the tides of history. Fittingly, the film ends with the deceased white zombie and her lover disappearing into the sea as the voice of a black character intones, forgive them who are dead and give peace and happiness to the living. At the historical moment, I walked with a zombie was offering its cultural critique of empire. A new and innovative zombie music was emerging to give expression to rebellious countercurrents amongst African Americans. The very year the film appeared, in 1943, the so-called Harlem riot erupted following the shooting of a black soldier by a white cop. The Harlem uprising came amidst a growing radicalization of, Amer of African Americans in unions, the military and burgeoning civil rights organizations. As new practices and cultures of resistance formed, music became a key register for expressing discontent with racism, menial jobs, unemployment, poor wages, and military conscription. In after-hours clubs and apartments, a young, defiant generation of jazz musicians forged a radically new musical language, soon known as bebop, as an aesthetic idiom for new structures of feeling, anger, pride, nonconformity with white America, hostility to racism, and privilege. Bebop was a complex, musically sophisticated, emotionally expressive protest music. It required exceptional musicianship and creativity and enormous facility at improvisation. In and through it, the new jazz revolutionaries produced a music of dissonance, of jarring contrasts and polyrhythms as they turned chord progressions around, played against a tune's underlying harmony and shifted tempos, all in an effort to create a visionary African-American aesthetic that spoke to a world in disarray while pulsating with the rhythms of zombie rebellion. One of the geniuses at the heart of this artistic revolution was pianist Thelonious Monk, who created a series of remarkable jazz compositions built around his singularity or his singularly angular phrasing, highlighted by unusual intervals, dissonance, and displaced notes. Amongst fellow jazz artists, Monk's musical language was sometimes known as zombie music. Pianist Mary Lou Williams explains, why zombie music? Because the screwy chords reminded us of music from Frankenstein or any horror film. In Monk's music, screwy chords express the rhythms of a world out of joint, a space of reification in which people are reduced to things and in which they violently awaken from their frozen state. This is an, this is an, this is an aesthetic of disharmony 
of a broken world whose bits can never be entirely reassembled. There's a stark and unsettling beauty here, one comprised of frozen sounds, as Williams puts it. Monk's tunes insert us into a world in which things come to life, in which, to reprise Marx, tables begin to dance and evolve grotesque ideas out of their wooden brains. But in Monk's compositions, we hear not only the jarring sounds of things coming to life. More than this, we need the rhythms of zombie movement, the ferocious sounds of the dance of the living dead. It is now widely recognized that the entire African-American experience is bathed in living death and the double consciousness of being both person and thing. And Monk's music captures this in the monstrously beautiful cadences of the banging, smashing, crashing chords of an emerging African-American protest music, one that gave a new urban cadence to the rhythmic cry of the slave, to use Dubois' apt expression. The music of the enslaved, both song of sorrow and cry of freedom, is like all horror idioms, a language of doubling. Across these musical landscapes, freedom and bondage clash, producing that jarring dissonance in which pursued and pursuer reverse positions, each chasing and fleeing the other. Only a music of polyrhythms, shifting tempos, and displaced notes could begin to capture the ugly beauty of this experience, to invoke the title of one of Monk's compositions. After all, enunciating the wounds and scars of oppression, the beauty of zombie music can only be ugly. In giving voice to bodies in pain, it howls these wounds, names them, explores them, accents them. For this reason, horror must remain one of its idioms, and yet in its very artistic production, it defiantly asserts the enduring beauty of survival and resistance and of the pursuit of freedom. For as Monk's preeminent biographer states, Thelonious Monk's music is essentially about freedom, and this contributes to its haunting beauty. Like Frankenstein's creature, the crippled monsters of labor, the descendants of African slaves speak and sing, dance, and create world-moving art. Through this zombie music, the living dead come to life, dance across a landscape of corpses and ruin, and affirm the irreducible beauty of their freedom song. Today, modern jazz no longer occupies its central position as protest music, even if its influences can be detected in genres as diverse as hip-hop and Afrobeat. Interestingly, a new zombie music of sorts carrying a jazz influence, emerged in Nigeria during the 1970s, just as neoliberal globalization was setting in and provoking the spate of vampire and zombie tales we have explored. In Fila Kuti's hit album Zombie from 1977, the image of the living dead is redeployed in a searing attack on the Nigerian army, whose members and their political masters figure zombified monsters preying on the people. A churning mix of black power, socialism, and pan-Africanism, Kuti's Afrobeat music both reflected and inspired social protest and opposition, including riots in Accra during a 1978 performance of Zombie. As in I Walked with a Zombie, Kuti's famous tune reverses the metaphor, portraying the ruling classes and their troops as the true zombies, not those who labor for capital. Like the Gothic novel, Kuti's tune rehearses a dialectical reversal whose classic formulation is to be found in Hegel's drama of master and slave. In his phenomenology of spirit, Hegel takes us through a role reversal in which the master, in his dependence on the labor of the slave, becomes a passive, lifeless being bereft of historical initiative, while the slave discovers in labor her life-generating, world-building capacities. The dialectic thus undergoes a, boom, a boomerang effect, zombifying society's rulers and awakening the oppressed to their historical capacity to extend the realm of human freedom. If in the Hegelian dialectic, progress in the realization of freedom can be carried out only by the slave, historical reversal toward freedom comes for Marx by way of the insurgence of the global pro proletariat. But here Marx's knowledge was deficient as he too did not grasp the extent to which an actual revolution made by African slaves, the Haitian Revolution, 
figured directly in Hegel's view that the freedom of slaves must be won through their own emancipatory struggle and a revolutionary trial by death. But Susan Buckmorse, but Susan Buckmorse's path-breaking research in this area suggests persuasively that Hegel not only followed Haitian events, but that, but that he used the, the sensational events of Haiti as the linchpin in his argument in the phenomenology of spirit. In so doing, she reinstates the dialectic of race and class that is constitutive of capitalist modernity, while demonstrating that a revolutionary movement of black slaves was the high point of freedom struggles in the age of revolution. Rethinking the history of bourgeois modernity in this way requires that we read the post-Hegelian treatment of the master-slave relation through Fanon as much as Marx. Indeed, doing so renders more powerful Marx's reversal of the zombie dialectic. After all, Marx depicts capitalists, too, as prisoners of reification, as systematically zombified. The capitalist, he writes, functions only as personified capital, capital as a person, just as the worker is no more than labor personified. In strictly economic terms, it is capital that rules, not capitalists. The latter are mere bearers of capital's imperatives. Because they are merely things personified, the rule of the capitalist over the worker is the rule of things over man, of dead labor over the living. As a result, capitalists too function as the living dead. Colonized and directed by things, they live hollowed out lives, spiritually poor for all their plenty. Yet reified though they are, capitalists do not have an interest in or capacity for de-reification. Instead, they find absolute satisfaction in this process of alienation, whereas the worker confronts it as a rebel and experiences it as a process of enslavement. While capitalists can only remain in their zombie state, workers are impelled toward a dialectical awakening. And yet there are blockages here which perpetuate the sleep-like state and postpone the moment of awakening. And the danger is that the moment of awakening might be missed, to paraphrase Adorno. But differently, there is, but differently, there is a danger that the proletariat might not be monstrous enough, that its internal separations, the ultimate key to capital's power over it, might leave it too uncoordinated to perform its zombie dance. Because internal division is the secret of the zombie sleep and labor's relation to capital, to its submissiveness and subordination to an alien will, Marx saw the key to unions and workers' organization not in their strictly material achievements, but rather in the spirit of opposition they cultivated. Without struggle, resistance, and international organization, he argued, workers risked becoming apathetic, thoughtless, more or less well-fed instruments of production. In short, zombies who cannot awaken. Until that awakening, monstrous utopia lives on on in stories, dreams, music, art, and moments of resistance that prefigure the grotesque movements through which the collective laborer throws off its zombified state in favor of something new, frightening, and beautiful. And this returns us to the emancipation of the body, to the liberation of monstrous corporality and sensuous existence from the abstracting circuits of capital. But it, but it should also serve to remind us that there is no emancipation of the body short of a radical transformation of the relations between persons and things, short of the liberation of all our relations to the world, seeing, hearing, tasting, feeling, thinking, contemplating, sensing, wanting, acting, loving. It is the essence of any materialist phenomenology that humans are enmeshed in an object world, shaped in and through their practical activity, Clothes, dwellings, beds, chairs, tables, cups, plates, tools, toys, books, and more comprise the social material and meaningful nexus of all lived experience. Yet capitalism inserts the market as forced mediator in our relations to such things. It wraps objects in the straitjacket of the capitalist value form, and in so doing it empties them of their concrete, sensible features, turning them into mere repositories of exchange value. Warmth is ebbing from things, observed Walter Benjamin in a reflection on the hollowing out of things into mere vessels of phantom objectivity, value. As Stellibras brilliantly reminds us, these dynamics of reification and abstraction 
touched so personal an item for Marks as his own overcoat, whose circuits in and out of the pawn shop he gloomily tracked. Ironically, an overcoat figured crucially in the actual life and death of Eris Kint, the anatomized subject of Rembrandt's The Anatomy of Dr. Nicholas Tulp. Unable to procure the money with which to buy one, Kint resorted to a non-market solution, theft. For that, he was convicted, executed, and dissected. It is such struggles between life and death bound up with our relations to things that marks tracks throughout capital. The overcoming of the rule of the market thus also means a restoration of the world of concrete objectivity, so that objects might become things that are touched and loved and worn. The liberation of people from the dictates of the market entails for Marx the reconnection with things in their concrete, sensuous, textured particularities. Dialectical reversal means not only the political victory of the oppressed, it also means de-reification, the reanimation of the relations amongst things and persons via the liberation of things, as well as persons from circuits of abstraction. It seems particularly significant that such a drama of reconnection with things appear prominently in a series of stories that Marx created for his daughter, Eleanor, Centered on a down-on-his-luck magician named Hans Ruckel, who kept a toy shop, Marx spun these stories for his daughter over several months. Ruckel, explained Eleanor Marx, was always hard up. His shop was full of the most wonderful things, of wooden men and women, giants and dwarfs, kings and queens, workmen and masters, animals and birds, as numerous as Noah got into the ark, tables and chairs, carriages, boxes of all sorts and sizes. And though he was a magician, Hans could never meet his obligations either to the devil or the butcher, and was therefore, much against the grain, constantly obliged to sell his toys to the devil. These then went through wonderful adventures, always ending in a return to Hans Ruckel's shop. Here we observe the dialectic of loss and recovery, as Hans Ruckel's toys are alienated in payment to the devil, disappear into commodity circuits where they undergo great adventures, only, re only to return to his shop. And in this return resides the dreams of utopia, in their reversion to use value and their disalienation, in their exit from the circuits of market exchange, things are recuperated, their ebbing warmth restored. There's a magic at work in liberation, then, one that brings persons and things back to life and breaks the spell of zombieism. That magic resides often in stories today, just as it did in Marx's tales for his daughter. Lurking in such stories, observes Silco, are relentless forces, powerful spirits, vengeful, restlessly seeking justice. In Almanac of the Dead, she thus imagines Marx as a storyteller who worked feverishly to gather together a, a magical assembly of stories to cure the suffering and evils of the world. Ultimately, as Marx well knew, magical stories pressed to be taken up by magic hands, to borrow Fanon's term, rather than, rather than the detached hands to which capital tries to reduce them, the world proletariat needs to become a many-headed and many-handed monster, like Shelley's Demogorgon, the people monster, capable of shaking the very planets and, upend and upending Jupiter's throne. We glimpse something of these possibilities in Jack Cade's ramblings, in the battles of Black Tiger, in the mobs that smashed the locks and burned down the prisons, in Barnaby Rudge, in the industrious women of the city who storm government offices and police stations in infinite riches. Too often, however, these insurgent crowds stop short, seeking liberation at the hands of others. This is why everything rests, as Fanon saw, on the oppressed realizing that everything depends on them, that there is no such thing as a demiurge, that there is no famous man who will take the responsibility for everything, but that the demiurge is the people themselves, and the magic hands are finally only the hands of the people. It is those magic hands that possess the power to slay the monsters of the market, until such time the endless toilers of the earth will continue to nurture monstrous desires for utopia as they walk the endless dream of their roads.